Super, więc z tego co wiemy, jesteśmy on... So we are online and Guillaume Pitron uh, should be able to hear us. Our second lecture will be uh, concerned with the geopolitics of um, rare uh, raw materials. Uh, do we, are we in touch with uh, Monsieur Pitron? I can hear you very well. I hope you hear me. Uh, yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you for inviting me uh, online to Warsaw. I am very happy to be and proud to be here, especially to speak after such a prominent uh, scientist as uh, Valérie Masson Delmotte. Um, let, me introduce, let me introduce myself in a few words. Uh, I am a French journalist. I am a reporter. Uh, I travel to the fields. I am a documentary maker for the French German television Arte. And I am the author of a book uh, which I'm going to introduce to you. Uh, was named in French La Guerre des Métaux Rares. And in Polish, the book is named, and I'm just trying to change the slide, but it doesn't work on my phone. Yes, it works. Uh, I will not uh, try to um, pronounce the correct um, uh, title in Polish because I don't speak Polish, but this book was published uh, recently in Poland by Kogut, uh, which is a, a Polish editor. Uh, and uh, that's also one of the reasons why I have been invited for this uh, conference, because this uh, work uh, is also available to you. Um, I would like to uh, tell you that I've been, um, I completely agree with what has been said just before by Valérie melson delmotte I entirely uh, 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 agree with the conclusions of the various reports linking human activities to the environment. We are uh, going through huge upheavals when it comes to climate change, and uh, we absolutely have to act in order to stop the climate change. As a journalist, I also try to figure out, and that's going to be the reason of my, uh, the subject of my of discussion I will have with you today, but I've asked myself, what will the green world look like once we have turned towards a post-oil era and a post-coal era, which, by the way, will take a long time, but once we turn more and more towards a greener world, less CO2 emission world, a decarbonized world, uh, what would be the new challenges of this uh, new uh, green world that we're going to shape together? And my point is not to question the necessity to do the energy transition. We absolutely have to do the energy transition for sure. But still, as a journalist, my responsibility is to question the new challenges that we're going to face as we're going to turn towards a green world. And uh, these challenges are absolutely fascinating. I'd like to introduce you to them. Uh, as you know, we have been um, um, uh, trying to change. I'm trying to change the, um, the slides. OK, that works directly on the screen. Uh, we, uh, as you remember, back in 2015, we have signed the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement, it was almost six years ago, uh, was uh, an amazing uh, agreement which brought together 185 countries in order to sign the Paris Agreement. The, that was during the COP21, and the idea is to really accelerate the energy transition and to be able to uh, accelerate to look towards the decarbonization of our economies, of our electricity production, in order to meet the, the goal of limiting the climate change by 1.5 degrees by the end of the century. Now, as we move towards this world, we are moving uh, from uh, oil uh, and coal 
electricity production, electricity being produced from oil and coal, and we're moving towards electricity uh, being produced by uh, uh, other kinds of means and also green technologies. Uh, we move towards solar panels, we move towards uh, wind turbines, we move towards uh, electric cars, and these technologies are emitting much less CO2. This is very good news. They don't use that much oil, they don't use that much coal in order to be manufactured, but actually they use other resources. And these resources, as the title of the book says, these resources are rare metals. In the Earth's crust, you've got what we call abundant metals, like iron, copper, uh, aluminium, and you also have in the Earth's crust what we call rare metals. And let me just introduce you with the next slide. And I can't change the slide. Thank you very much. I think someone is changing the slide for me, and that's the way we're going to work for the for the rest of the of the conference. We're also uh, more and more depending upon rare metals, and these rare metals you see a couple of names of rare metals here, such as barite, indium, um, niobium, bismuth. REE is rare earth elements, which is a specific family of rare metals: scandium, tungsten, germanium. These metals are called rare because they are much more rare in the Earth's crust than the base metals. So if, for example, in a mine, uh, you have like a base metal like iron, well, if you extract one kilogram of iron from the Earth's crust, for the same amount of rock that you extract for getting one kg of iron, you will get one gram of neodymium, which is a rare metal. So neodymium is on average, 1,000 times more rare in the Earth's crust than a base metal like iron. And some of these metals are 2,000 times more rare, 3,000 times more rare. So these metals are not really rare because actually we find them everywhere in the world. We can even find some in the abyss of the oceans. But if they are so much diluted into the Earth's crust that actually uh, you need to extract a lot of rock in order to, to extract them and to refine them and to use them in the industrial processes. So this is what sometimes the reason why we call them rare. And these metals are also called critical by the European Union. And I must tell you that the European Union plays a huge important role for the 27 countries of the European Union in order to let uh, their country, member countries, know about what it calls critical metals. This could be rare metals, but these critical metals have a specificity because they are being produced by a specific set of countries. There is a risk that uh, the lack of furniture of exports of these metals from a producing countries to the European Union might cause uh, shortages of supplies. And for these reasons, there is a risk of supply of shortages. And for this reason, we call these metals also, for most of the rare metals, they are called critical metals by the European Union. Next slide. Thank you. So basically, uh, these metals are important for what you see here. They're important for, for example, uh, solar panels. Solar panels are made of silicium. Silicium is not a rare metal, it's very abundant, but it's considered as a critical metal by the European Commission. Wind turbines, especially offshore wind turbines, can contain up to one ton of rare earths uh, into their uh, operating device. Uh, also, the electric car, like you, like you, that you see on the on the right of the screen, these electric cars have, for most of them, ninety percent of them, uh, a neodymium, which is a specific rare metals for making the engine of the car work, and also these metals for the battery of the electric car. Uh, the battery of the electric car contains uh, critical metals like lithium and also other rare and critical metals like cobalt, um, graphite, which is a very important mineral. And uh, we can also, you know, give more examples of all the minerals that are necessary for the electric cars. Next slide. The energy transition is actually also a digital transition. Uh, which means that if you want to actually operate correctly the electrical grids, you need, as you know, the green technologies are not available all the time. When there is no sun, well, there is no solar panel 
providing electricity. So you need to make sure that actually the green technologies work along with digital technologies that help operate from, from an informatic viewpoint, the electrical networks. The computers will actually make sure that the, the, the supply of electricity into the grid meets at a precise moment the demand for such electricity so that there is no there is no waste of electricity. So we need technologies, digital technologies, in order to make the green energy transition possible. And if I want to talk about one technology among many others, let's talk about your phone. Let's talk about what you have in your pocket. Because you all, all you, digital technologies have rare metals to make them work. And in a phone, you have a lot of these rare metals, as you can see on this slide. I like to point uh, the metal, which is IN, on the top left in orange, IN, which is indium. You all have indium in your pockets. Indium makes your screens uh, touchable. So since indium has actually covered the, the screens of the smartphones, especially the iPhones, it makes the screens touchable. And that is a complete change comparing to the time where I used to send text messages by touching literally the, the physical touches of my phone. This is over thanks to indium. And we don't even know about the existence of indium, but without indium, our life would be completely changed. And that is the example of this, the importance of these metals in digital technologies. Next slide. Actually, when you look at the percentage of the world production of these metals, being used for uh, for uh, for digital technologies, this slide tells us how much of the world production of these metals is being mobilized for various applications such as flat panels or magnets or semiconductors and other uh, other devices. So, if I take the example, for example, of dysprosium, as you can see, dy is being used uh, for electric, uh, electrical uh, for magnets. Sixty-three percent of the world production of neodymium is used for magnets, and I can multiply the examples of this kind. Next slide. And um, we use a larger variety of these metals today for our uh, technologies. Uh, if you compare, the, for example, the very basic former uh, uh, windmill of the 18th century compared to the green technologies today, what you see is that a, a, a wider variety of these metals are being used for these new technologies. These new technologies are more and more complex. They are made of alloys, which means that we mix the metals together and we Thanks to the mixture of these metals together, actually the alloys are much stronger, the property of the raw materials are much better, and the more we turn towards green technologies, the more we turn towards complex technologies. Next. And I just would like to um, remind you that I'm a journalist. And as a journalist, I said to myself, well, this is a wonderful world. We're turning, to, turning towards a less coal uh, production world, a less CO2 emitting world. Uh, we have green technologies available for us in order to progressively uh, you know, uh, respect and uh, achieve the, the goals of the Paris Agreement. But my questions are, and we have the metals which are available actually to make these green technologies possible. But my questions are, where are we going to get these metals? At what cost for the environment and for humans? Are we going to extract them and refine them? Which countries are going to produce these uh, phones uh, for these uh, metals in the future? And due to their uh, you know, important role in the world production of these metals, are there going to be winners and losers on the rare metals chess in the 21st century, as there have been winners and losers on the oil chess back in the 20th century? And what I would like to tell you is that when we look at the energy transition through the bias of the technology of the metals, without which there would be no transition at all, we tend to have a different look at what we call the green technologies. And let me take you first to the northern province of Heilongjiang in China, where I was in 2019. Next. Uh, next picture, please.
I'd like to put the next slide. Thank you. What we see here is a view from a graphite mine. A graphite is absolutely necessary for making uh, green technologies possible, uh, and more precisely for making the battery of the cars possible, of the electric cars. And what we see is a drone view that I've uh, myself taken two years ago uh, on the when I was reporting on the field. And what we see is a graphite. Uh, we see the, graph the rock being extracted, and we see all these roads uh, being uh, built in the mountains in order to extract the graphite from the mountains. Next slide. And the next picture tells us about, uh, you know, the dumps of the industries refining graphite directly being rejected in savage, uh, uh, savage uh, industrial zones without any uh, agreement from local authorities or surrounding populations. The next slide also tells us about, next slide please, about the men working in the, in the, in the, in the refining areas. These men, as you can see them, are completely protected, covered, their masks covered with uh, face masks, because if they breathe the air filled with particles of graphite, it becomes very bad for their, for their health. And I would like to show you the next slide also, which explains more why it's bad for your health. Actually, that is my hand that I really literally put uh, into a, a bag of graphite and you see the powder, the dust of graphite, which is very thin. And so you can imagine how bad it can be to actually breathe such kind of air. And people around in these areas routinely talk to you about all the impacts that this extraction and industrial activities can have on their uh, uh, on their health. Next slide. On the next slide, what you see is actually the bags of graphite being ready for being exported, at least uh, uh, taken outside of uh, this province of Heilongjiang, and ready for being bought by various industrials, including the industrials of the green technologies, so that it will be possible to manufacture the batteries of the electric cars. Now, with the next slide, I would like to take you towards another region where I visited at the same time in 2019, and the city of Baotou, which is close to Beijing. And in the next slide, what you see is actually the manufacturers refining the rare earth elements, and notably the neodymium, which makes it possible to manufacture iPhones and also manufacture 90% of the electric cars, uh, of the engines of the electric cars. And we see huge uh, manufacturers uh, ready for, I mean, actually refining the rare earths. And the next slide is another picture of these refineries. Uh, very impressive, as you can see. Uh, actually, a lot of chemicals are being used for refining the rare earths, and a lot of um, water is being used for this refinery uh, process. And where does the water go? Well, the next slide tells us that the water goes to directly to uh, an artificial lake whose name is the Wikwang Dam. And this artificial lake, and you can also change uh, to the next slide, uh, is actually filled with the waters being rejected directly by these uh, activities of rare earth refineries. And around this lake, where I've been several times over the last 10 years, people tell you, well, uh, we have cancer problems, uh, we have various disease problems, the agricultural land uh, cannot, uh, you know, uh, is not fertile anymore, the crops don't grow up anymore. Um, it's hard to get figures. And uh, if the figures exist, let me tell you, no one will know about these figures because, uh, you know, the communist regime in China doesn't want to have such figures being published. So what we can do only is just listen to the people around and also listen to the officials in the rare earth industry in China. Because the officials talk openly about that and say they talk about radioactivity being rejected during the separation process of the rare earths. 
and they talk about companies uh, which refine the rare earths, being irresponsible, and which do whatever they want, whatever the regulation, because they are kings where they are. And so this is, you know, the reality also of the extraction of the minerals that are necessary for making the world uh, greener thanks to green technologies. Next slide, please. It's good to refine. It's necessary to, it's better to recycle. It's necessary to recycle so that an electric car is actually being replaced by, I mean, the, the, the metals of an electric car are being reused for making another electric car. And uh, recycling, and I will come back to that later in the speech, but will be key in order to make the green energy transition possible. The thing is, it's very hard to recycle these metals because as I explained to you before, they are mixed with other metals into alloys. And if we want to recycle them, well, you need to separate them. You need to actually separate all the metals which are brought together to, in order to reuse them in technologies. And these figures coming from the European Commission, the European Union, tells us that some, some of these metals can be roughly refined, such as vanadium, tungsten. But the more we go towards the, the right side of the screen, the more we see that other metals, such as rare earths, but also graphite, germanium, silicium, are not being refined and almost not being refined at all because it's very complex and it's very time consuming and it's very expensive to refine them. And because it's too expensive to refine them, it's less expensive to go back to the mine. And so we know how to refine these metals, but we don't want to refine them. We prefer we, uh, to recycle, excuse me. We know how to recycle these metals, but we don't want to recycle them because it's a pure economic uh, uh, calculus which is being made by the industrials because they want to pay less, then they will go back to the mine rather than going back to get the metal from the recycler. So this is a huge issue. Now let's take us to the next slide where actually uh, I tell you about the Polish electricity system. As I understand, uh, these metals are today polluting and they explain why the green technologies are not green. And they tell us also that an electric car is not a clean car. It always has a cost to manufacture the minerals in order to, ma to, 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 to manufacture a car. And there is also another pollution which you need to take into account. It is a type of electricity that is being produced in order to uh, fill in the electric car with, uh, to fill the battery of the electric car. An electric car is as clean as the type of electricity that actually makes the electric car uh, run. And we should look at in every country where the electric cars will get more and more numerous, the kind of electricity that makes the electric car run. In France, this electricity comes from nuclear industry for 70% of our electricity mix. So that makes the electric cars interesting from a CO2 emitting viewpoint, very interesting. Um, but when we look at the Polish uh, electricity mix, as you know it better than me, you see that coal is much more important in the national production of electricity, which means that the electric car will be much more polluting than in France. And it will be always better to use an electric car compared to an oil car it will emit in Poland less CO2 emissions, maybe half less, maybe 40% uh, less, maybe 30% less. I don't have this precise figure. Uh, it will emit less CO2 than an oil car, but it will still emit CO2 because it needs to be manufactured with metals and also because the type of electricity uh, in the uh, Polish electricity mix is made, uh, as you know, of uh, for a good part of it, of coal. So at the end, it's good to move towards electric cars. But if you ask me if this is a perfect uh, green technology, I will tell you obviously not. In China, an electric car during all its uh, life can emit up to 70% of the CO2 emissions of an oil car. So that is still 30% uh, better than an oil car, but that's not green at all. That is not a green technologies. And uh, I think it's important to keep that in mind that we 
progress because we use less, we emit less CO2, but that doesn't mean that we are actually finding the perfect solution in order to achieve the energy transition. And I will go back later to how we make the energy transition better. Now I want to take you to the next slide. And uh, this slide is important because it tells us in the past, who, which countries, which companies were actually producing rare earths, which is a very strategic rare metal. Uh, which countries and which companies were producing these rare earths for the rest of the planet? And at the time, some companies in Australia, such as Linas or Rhone Poulenc in France, uh, were actually extracting and refining the rare earths, which would be necessary for making the world greener. We were back in the 1980s. The problem is that, as you understand, the production of these rare earths and all the metals in general was extremely polluting. And it was so polluting that the Australians, the French, but also the Americans, back in the 90s, said at some point, we just have to get rid of this production. We don't want to take care any more of this production. And uh, because it was too polluting. And at the same time, China was a country which was absolutely, absolutely and it's still today, absolutely rich of these uh, metals. China gets almost around 40% of the world resource of rare earths. And China said, but you know, guys, you in Europe, you don't want to get polluted with these metals. But we in China, we are much poorer than you. And we have to catch up our delay. And we have these resources. So why don't you just close, shut down your manufacturers, and these manufacturers will reopen automatically in China, and we will produce rare earths at a much better price, much less expensive to produce rare earths in China that you guys in Europe, and everyone will be happy. We in China will get richer. We will catch up progressively our delays and whatever the cost on the environment that was back in the 90s. And you in Europe and the rest of the Western world, you will get these metals clean, refined, virgin, and you'll be able to put this metal in your green technologies and say, we're clean, we're doing our energy transition, we're respectful of other generations. And this is what happened. This is what happened. We were so happy. This was actually the happy globalization. And the work of divided, ladies and gentlemen, between those who were dirty and those who were dirty today and those who pretend to be clean. And the dirty people are the Chinese and the people who pretend to be clean, it's we the Europeans because we don't produce these metals anymore. And it's true about many other metals. And we need to keep that in mind that we relocate the pollution of the green technologies from our countries to other countries, which have to pay the cost because everyone on earth has to pay a cost somewhere. The next slide is also very interesting because it tells us today, due to this reorganization of the mining production of rare metals, who is actually producing what? What critical, which critical minerals, according to the EU Commission, are being produced by whom? And as you see, and this uh, map is a map dating back to 2020, uh, USA is producing a few of them. Uh, Brazil and Chile are producing a few of these critical metals. The Democratic Republic of Congo also, South Africa, Russia, but especially what you see is what? Well, this is China. And China is so rich of these metals. So many resources are actually concentrated in China. The Chinese have been so eager to actually produce these metals for the rest of the world, especially for the Europeans, that actually, well, they produce almost all of them. I exaggerate when I say almost all of them, but they produce a large amount of these metals. They produce antimony, barite, bismuth. That is not going to be easy for the translator to translate that, so I'm not going to exaggerate. But I just let you understand and read on this map how strong China has become on the rare metals chest, on the critical metals chest. We Europeans are not only, only, not only dependent upon Qatari supplies of gas or Saudi, Saudi Arabia supplies of oil. We are dependent in this green world on China for the supplies of, of all these resources, which are very, very strategic for greener future, for green technologies 
and for digital technologies. The thing is, the Chinese said to us, okay, we are back in 2000, in the year 2000, 20 years ago, and suddenly we start to hear a different music coming from the Chinese side. The Chinese start to say, listen, guys, uh, we need these resources for our own development. We, uh, you know, undergo 10% economic growth every year, and these metals are very helpful for our own green technologies and on our own mobile phones. And actually, we will start to get to supply less of these metals to you. We will export less and less every year of these metals to you in order to keep these metals for our own uh, Chinese economic growth, our own Chinese needs. And that started to be a problem for the Europeans because they said, hmm, how are we going to get these metals? And the Chinese had an answer. They said, you know what? Why don't you come to China? You cannot get access to these metals or less access to these metals, which are less being exported. But if you relocate, you relocate your, your activities, your industries in China, there is no export anymore. You are an internal buyer of these metals and you'll get unlimited access to the critical metals. And the next slide tells us that over the 20, 30, 40 years, we have moved toward China for many reasons that you're aware of. We moved to China because the Yuan uh, has been and is still today under-evaluated, and that makes the Chinese uh, industry competitive. We have moved to China because the labor cost was much more competitive and it still is today. And we've moved to China because we wanted to get access to the Chinese internal market. And that would be an opportunity for the French uh, and European and Western companies to access to a, a new market filled of people who are getting richer and we want to, to access to the consumption society. But we also moved to China because we needed to get access to the resource, because we needed to get access to the, to the, to the, to the, to the raw materials. The next slide is also important. What does it tell us? It tells us that China today doesn't only produce the metals, but produce the green technologies themselves. And as you see, China today, and that is an average figure, produces what? 62% of the world batteries. That is batteries for electric cars. That is a huge figure. How did China come up from being a producer of, of, of minerals to being a producer and an exporter of the finished product, the green finished product with the minerals inside. Because China said, okay, you're coming to China, you're coming to my country and you're going to, re you're going to relocate your industries. But when you relocate your industry, your manufacturing, at some point you need to relocate your research and development department. And then you start to relocate uh, your experts, your laboratory experts, your researchers, all these people are progressively moving towards China in order to actually accompany these manufacturers in China into the development of added value. And China signs joint ventures with foreign companies. Joint ventures where China holds at least 51% of the joint venture. And China learns a lot about not only about, about the uh, the, the gray cells, about the know-how of the experts coming from Europe. And one time, one Chinese um, university uh, professor at the University of Tsinghua in Beijing said to me, the Westerners haven't understood the capacity of the Chinese to learn. The Chinese have learned so much of us. They have learned so much of, of all these uh, uh, gray cells, all this knowledge that we have passed on to them thanks to these joint ventures. And suddenly the Chinese could not only learn from our own technologies, but they could create their own technologies, not manufactured in China, but created in China. And China, what has done China? China has moved down the value chain over the last decades. China has moved down from a status of just being a producer of um, very basic materials sold at a very low price to being a powerful technological country, which is being able actually to produce solar panels, wind turbines, batteries of electric cars, electric cars with the metals it produces inside. 
And then when it moves up to the value chain, China is getting much richer. It, it nurtures the, need, the, the, the growth of China itself. It also explains why the trade balance between China and other countries, such as the United States, is so disbalanced. And it explains the trade war that is being waged back to Trump uh, back for the last five years. And uh, this is must be understood. The Chinese have, has had a very strong strategy, understanding from the very beginning that they would not sell for such a long time just the metals. They would sell the finished products. Next slide, please. This uh, quote is important by uh, the CEO of Glencore, even Glasenberg, who has sold uh, its cobalt production, a good bunch of its cobalt production from Congo, uh, Congo Kinshasa to the Chinese in 2019. And uh, he, because uh, the Chinese don't have cobalt, and uh, uh, Glasenberg said, China is going to have the major part of exported cobalt between its hands, and they're not going to sell batteries to the world more than, more than likely they'll produce batteries in China and sell electric vehicles to the world. So even Glasenberg tells us basically the Chinese understand perfectly well the importance to secure the supply of strategic resources in order to be able to produce the manufacturing. And they want to control all the supply chain, all the chain from the mine to the finished products. And they have a strategy. And the question is, we the Europeans, do we have a strategy? Well. Let me tell you, we don't have a strategy, and the Chinese are able to seize the long term. Next slide, please. What will Biden do? What will the United States do? Because now we move towards a greener age where we understand that we are being dependent upon Chinese supplies for green technologies. And now we read reports everywhere at the European Commission level, at the state level, at the US level, that we just uh, are dependent upon Chinese supplies. And how are we going to do in order to, to be dependent again, to, de to develop a mineral sovereignty strategy? And Biden is very much aware of that, as well as Trump was very much aware of that. And what does Biden want to do? Well, he wants to open mine in the United States. He wants to open mine on federal land in order to produce the minerals for a greener future. And the problem is that people are not happy. And the ecologists are not happy. The ecologists in the United States say, don't touch the land. Don't mine anywhere. We want a green world. But we're trying to explain then that the more we go green, the more we're going to have to dig deeper. And that is a very difficult situation to understand that the more we're going to have to get green, the more we're going to have to get to dig deeper. And the more we're going to have to open new mines. And in the United States, this debate is starting. And it's also starting in Europe, as I will tell. Next slide. Uh, the United States could have been interested in Afghanistan because Afghanistan has a huge uh, resource of, of, of notably lithium and also rare earths. The next slide tells us how rich uh, Afghanistan is of very uh, various uh, uh, minerals and also metals. And you can see that with the United States moving away from, from, uh, from Afghanistan, the land, uh, the space is being uh, made free for the Chinese. And the Chinese are getting now today very much interested in actually developing new mining relations with Afghanistan in order to, why not, extract some uh, lithium and rare earths from, from Afghanistan because uh, the, the, the Chinese lack lithium, they don't have lithium actually, and they would like to be able to, to, to diversify their sources of rare earths by uh, importing rare earths from other countries. And that tells us that there is a geopolitics of rare earths and of rare metals, and there is a geopolitics of green technologies taking shape. Because where are we going to secure supplies in the future for manufacturing all these technologies? We're going to secure the supplies from what? Indonesia, very rich country, of very wealthy country in terms of mining uh, potential. Bolivia, uh, Congo, um, the Arctic Circle, the North Pole, and why not uh, Afghanistan? So you see that in the 20th century, countries were trying to secure their oil supplies from various uh, areas of the world, including the Middle East, and that has made the Middle East so powerful for the last 100 years. And tomorrow, new countries, rich of these resources, will become very powerful. And that could be in Afghanistan. We don't know. That could be 
uh, Indonesia, that could be Bolivia, as I said, but there is a geopolitics of green technologies taking shape as we move towards this greener world. Next, please. Uh, this slide is very important because very recently in May, the International Energy Agency, based in Paris, uh, produced a document which is fascinating. It said, you know what? Given the needs we have for these technologies, we're going to have to actually multiply the production of lithium, graphite, cobalt, nickel, rare earths uh, for the next years. And by 2040, comparing to 2020, we're going to have to need more uh, lithium, 42 times more lithium. And the International Energy Agency insists upon that fact that the needs are going to explode. And the next slide tells us that there is a problem here. So this is a slide in French, forgive me for that, but this slide tells us that at this rate of consumption of various metals, there are risk of shortage, of geological shortages. And you see that whether we, uh, uh, we consume more or less of these metals, the years of uh, the, the years left of such resources available is changing. And the thing is, if we speak to each other within uh, for the next, uh, if we if we see each other in ten years, ladies and gentlemen, these three figures will be the same because there will not be any shortage, geological shortage, shortage at all, in my view, because the more we consume these metals, the more the extraction techniques get more sophisticated, and so. It means that we're always going to be able to, uh, this is going to be a race between uh, the explosion of our needs and the, 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 the best technologies, uh, the new technologies, which will make the extraction and the refining better. So the, the shortage can be uh, discussed, but still, uh, the, the question of some specific shortages for some specific metals, such as tungsten or cobalt, uh, can be addressed within 10 years. And for these two metals, for example, uh, worries by uh, geologists are very strong. But for the others, um, maybe there will be no shortage. Next slide, please. Uh, the, 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 as you see, this map tells us that the, the resource of and actually the availability of some rare earths, uh, which are very strategic, can be found a bit everywhere. Uh, many, many countries can actually offer some alternative sources for China, such as, uh, uh, such as Australia, South Africa, Brazil, Canada and the United States. So that slide tells us that, uh, you know, there will probably be no shortage of rare earths because once again, uh, new uh, production techniques and new countries can offer to answer, to, to, um, to, to offer rare earths in order to supply the demand. And the next slide also is very interesting because it tells us that in Europe, we have a lot of this resource. We can actually extract the, some of these metals for the green technologies uh, in our countries. Uh, lithium is a good example of a metal which can be easily extracted and refined and which is widely available in Europe. And uh, France uh, has some, but is not exploiting known. But actually, uh, this map tells us that uh, uh, Portugal and also um, Spain and also Austria, and uh, I don't see anything about Poland on this map, but uh, lithium can be easily produced and lithium is necessary for making the batteries of the electric cars possible. So the question is, will the European countries wake up and consider that they have to actually secure their own supplies by producing their own resource, by being sovereign, by developing what we call a mineral sovereignty. And that is going to come at a huge discussion cost, at a huge with big debates, because European citizens will have to understand that they need to bear a certain price, an ecological price of the energy transition. Next slide, please. What I would like to tell you is that, as you see, the greener world comes at huge, huge, uh, with huge uh, uh, challenges. It comes with new ecological challenges associated to 
mining activity, activities and its impacts on the environment and on the biodiversity. It comes at new economic challenges because China today is leading the race over rare, critical, strategic metals. And it also comes with new geopolitical challenges because there will be a, a, a geopolitics of, of, of green technologies taking shape. But once again, as I said in the beginning of this conference, I am absolutely certain we need to move towards a greener world. We need to move towards a post-oil era. The greener world will be not perfect, but it will be still a less CO2 emitting world. And if the urgency is to fight climate change, we have no other option. We need to take these technologies. We need to make them better. We need to fund research and development into for making solar panels, wind turbines, and, uh, and green cars, uh, electric cars, better tomorrow than today. And we need to actually also develop circular economy. And circular economy is the biggest challenge of our times. And in my view, it's much harder and much more ambitious than turning towards green technologies. The real challenges, the real adventure of the 21st century will not be to turn green, it will especially be to turn circular. Circularity means that at every step of the process of production of a resource, we make in sort to use less resources for the same um, wealth being produced. So at the mining side, we need to produce less resources. For the design of a product, we need to think during the design of the best way to recycle it, and that's going to make us save resources. We need to, during the consumption, to, for example, develop the service economy, the sharing economy, where several of us use the same products. Uh, we can share a car, we can share a scooter, in order to not having our own scooter and sharing it will mean less scooter, and then it will mean that the resource will be less consumed. Uh, we need to repair what is being broken. Uh, we need to reuse uh, what is being broken and what has been repaired. And eventually we recycle and we develop new technologies for recycling. But at every of the seven steps of the life cycle of a product, new technologies, new ways of organizing, of organization, new ways of uh, um, management uh, must be pushed in order to make more with less. That is the very idea of the circular economy. And if we go towards that, that into that direction, then it means that we're going to be able to not only move towards the post oil era, but also to be able to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to really come up with greener technologies. And uh, if I have to insist upon one solution and one huge challenge that we face today in order to accelerate the energy transition, this is circular economy. Just to wrap it up and to go back to Valérie masson delmotte speech, I think what you understood with Valérie masson delmotte speech is that our energy transition is lazy. We need to go faster. We need to have more radical decision making. And I believe the same. Our energy transition is lazy because we don't go farther into turning grain. The technologies we have are not green enough. Uh, we don't think about the way we consume. And I'm sure Valérie Masson Delmotte wouldn't uh, uh, debate with me the very idea that besides turning to a new technological uh, set of uh, to a new set of technologies the green transition is about also changing the way we consume it's to add a, re a revolution of our consciousness to the technological revolution which is being offered by state and enterprises and i think this is a very core message that i want to pass on to you we'll have to be much more radical and much more ambitious if we want to make the green transition possible, if we want to fight climate change, and if we want to turn toward, uh, to, to, to make the Paris Agreement a success. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm available for questions if you want. Um, thank you for this fascinating lecture. Are there any questions?
A good evening. I would like to ask you, because your book clearly shows that China has almost all of the uh, rare earth elements uh, and critical metals. So it seems like the fight is over. Uh, but do you know anything about what kind of resources we can find on the moon and whether the um, the space race, um, which has been announced by India, by China, by um, the US, is it worth fighting for the moon? And as far as I'm aware, there's some kind of international agreement uh, on not using the moon towards uh, exploration of this kind, but um, that's uh, just an agreement which can be broken. Um, well, you said that the fight is over. Uh, first, uh, there is no fight yet. I mean, uh, in a sense, uh, there is no military fight. Uh, no one has ever uh, shot a bullet in order to secure um, uh, a gram of rare earth or rare metal somewhere on Earth. That is important to say that right now. And I hope we, uh, the humankind, will be wise enough in the future to not replicate in the 21st century uh, so, you know, what happened during the 20th, 20th century when we wanted to secure oil. So the, the question is, will the history repeat itself or will we uh, learn from the past and make the Green Revolution also a more wise uh, revolution? Uh, then comes the question of the moon, uh, because obviously uh, asteroids, moon and uh, other planets in the solar system Are full of these uh, of these resources, and uh, the thing is, countries today race to to the moon, and they are interested in you know communicating about the fact that we can find nickel, for example, on an asteroid or on the moon. But very honestly, it's not tomorrow, and not even within a century that we're going to get uh, one gram of uh, strategic metal being brought back from space back to Earth. Uh, it's, it's just not going to happen. If these metals shall be extracted and, and used, they're going to be extracted and used for French, um, French, sorry, human colonies, Polish colonies on the moon. Uh, but that's not going to be brought back to Earth. What is coming at a shorter, uh, in the agenda at a shorter time period, it is uh, the oceans, because the depth of the oceans are filled with what we call polymetallic nodules, polymetallic nodules. And uh, these uh, small rocks actually, uh, you know, uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the depths of the Pacific, for example, are filled with these resources. And uh, three years ago, um, Japan said, we have discovered in an exclusive zone in the Pacific, uh, which is under the sovereignty of Japan, we have discovered uh, enough rare earths for 700 years of Japanese consumption. And what it means is that the access to these metals in the oceans is potentially unlimited. And if we multiply such announcements by other announcements by other countries, it's almost unlimited. I mean, it's finite, but we have so much of these resources everywhere in the depths of the ocean. So I think the next race is the oceans. The moon uh, might come before other reasons, but in order to secure uh, supplies of minerals for making green technologies, that could be, that could be the, the oceans. When, it's a difficult question to answer, there is a company, whose name is the Metals Company, which, uh, you know, pushes, uh, you know, it communicates very well into saying that uh, it can extract from the seas uh, these resources at an affordable price with uh, a, a less impacting, uh, with less impact on the environment than if the rare earths were being extracted on the, on, on the, on the ground. Um, that remains to be discussed. Uh, the competitivity of the price will be key, and uh, it's moving very slowly, this mining space, ocean mining space, and so slowly for the last 10, 20 years that I wouldn't take a risk myself telling you when we will be producing such metals 
at an industrial scale by digging into the oceans. Uh, so as you see, it's very difficult, very complex, very costly, uh, very impacting on the environment. Uh, Earth mine, the, the good old mines that we've been knowing for the last centuries and, and, and thousands of years will become uh, key in, uh, in the future. Dziękujemy bardzo ze względu na problemy techniczne na początku naszego wieczoru. Thank you so much. Due to technical problems at the beginning of our evening, we were delayed and we can no longer continue. But thank you so much for the lecture and for uh, concluding on a positive note. So if there are any questions, uh, it's your last chance. So just uh, wait a minute uh, for the mic. Uh, what about Antarctica? Well, like everyone on Earth, uh, Antarctica is filled with its resources. And there is certainly a link between uh, Russia getting interested in these territories and the fact that potentially these resources uh, could be extracted over there. Uh, it's tough to extract uh, uh, rare metals in Antarctica. I would uh, rather have an interest in Greenland. Uh, Greenland has uh, lots of these resources, uh, notably rare earths. And uh, you might be aware that um, the recent, uh, I think it was back in spring 2021, but the recent elections uh, put into the power a party which is completely against uh, the rare earth extraction uh, and they won the elections because they said that they would just refuse any foreign interest to dig rare earths on the Greenland territory. Uh, so I would, I would look at the news in specifically in this country rather than Antarctica in the short term. But that tells us once again that there is a new geopolitics of uh, green energies, that new countries will be hot points uh, in the earth because of uh, the importance of their uh, mining potential. I think that was the last question. So thank you very much for the lecture and Thank you for um, finishing on a positive note uh, with some solutions. Uh, thank you also to uh, the Institut Francais for uh, supporting um, this lecture series.